Okay, so um, get yourself into a good posture for meditation. Nice straight back. And just take a minute to settle into your space. So relax through the body, from the crown of your head down to the tip of your toes, allowing any tension to release. And before we start the main meditation, let's just spend a couple of minutes focused on the breath. Or if you find the breath uncomfortable, you can focus on a different physical sensation like the soles of your feet. But just spend a few moments in single pointedness. And just stay steady and simple. As thoughts arise, you notice them and allow them to pass without fixating or chasing, without suppression or avoidance. Just let them roll through, but they're not your main interest. And just gently catching yourself whenever you drift or sink. Come back to your focus.
And now consciously shift your mind from single pointedness to analysis. And just do an inner reflection, starting with refuge in Bodhicitta, about what is your inner refuge and how do you approach altruism? I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merit of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. How does that land? If you think about the three jewels as doctor, medicine, and nurses, are there points of resonance for you? Are there places that feel like refuge when you think of those three jewels? And then very gently with self-honesty and self-compassion, really think about your relationship to the eight worldly concerns as your substitutes for reliable refuge. We start by just thinking which ones are most common for me to turn to. So think about the first pair attachment to keeping and getting material things or people or situations and the fear of losing that. How common is that one? In an ordinary day, how much mental space is taken up by thinking about gain and loss or pleasure and pain, either of those.
and look at the chapters of the day and start with the morning when you wake up are the first thoughts of what can I get or what do I not want to lose? Or is it more about pleasure or avoiding pain? Getting something delicious or attached to the warmth of the bed? Afraid of the busyness of the morning or craving the sensory enjoyments of the breakfast or the shower. Just explore the different mixture of thoughts you have on an ordinary morning, looking for false refuges that might be problematic. Are there similar patterns in the morning as right before you go to bed? Things that you want and cling to or things that you fear and avoid. Or is it different? Doesn't matter either way. It's just an invitation to self-knowledge. Compare mornings to evenings. And then in the middle of the day, when you have more interactions with people, generally speaking, it's common to fall into the trap of hoping for praise and avoiding criticism or wanting to be thought well of and not wanting to be looked down on. So basically related to other people. So just kind of examine what your tendencies of push and pull, attachment and aversion are within the center of the day, particularly with other people. What false refuges do you seek? Does it ever feel extremely necessary to be thought well of and spoken well of? Or does it ever feel incredibly frightening if people are speaking badly about you to each other or to you? How much mental space does that take up, generally speaking?
and you're just inviting a compassionate noticing of your own mental trends. And circle back to refuge in bodhicitta now, thinking about bodhicitta. The prayer says, may I, by the merit of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings, which is like a reflection of the positive refuge. Thinking about merit in terms of mental energy, physical energy, verbal energy, directed towards the greater good, directed towards all sentient beings, including oneself. Try and think about times in which you've had momentum of that type, whether framed in those words or framed more generally, a day with empathy and altruism. How are you in those moments? And so sort of summarize all these thoughts by starting with the end, which is your own enlightenment, your own Buddhahood. The fact that your mind is trainable to this incredible extent that you can train it out of suffering and train it into happiness. You can train it out of harming and train it into benefit. And in order to do that, we have to touch deeply the medicine. And so what is your own medicine? Is it something as simple as compassion itself? Just frame it to yourself and let it sink in. What is my medicine? What is my method to achieving this enlightened state? And dedicate. John Chosem Chorin Poche, Make Panam Ke Yuachi, Kevan Yam Pame Pai, Gone Gondu Pawan Show.
May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Okay, so we'll have um, about a 25 minute break. So welcome back. And we just did our meditation on the eight worldly concerns in kind of just a reflective way. How did it go? Were you, were you kind of able to notice different worldly concerns took prominence at different types of times of day? Or there's one that was just your go-to all the time, regardless of what time of day? Shall I pop them back on the screen or you've know them all too well <laughs> I think the thing that was most sorry I'm like doing things I'm talking to you the thing that was most helpful for me was remembering that with attachment I will always be disappointed always yeah and the idea too that there's a positive and a negative to wanting to belong to feeling accepted all that stuff that actually I can do that without attachment mm. So yep. That's my piece that was helpful to me. It's your piece, yes. Attachment is the troublemaker. Of course, aversion is as well, but I think aversion and anger and all of those related things are easier to catch because they're so uncomfortable. Right. Attachment's harder to catch because while it's getting what it wants, it's quite pleasant, <laughs> you know, so but true. then <laughs> then it gets thwarted and then anger coming. <laughs> Right. It's my uh, my own teacher's classic English phrase. He goes, "Attachment going, anger coming, <laughs> necessarily." <laughs> and and uh, it's true. It's true. Yeah. What what came up when you were guys were thinking about those eight worldly concerns? Yeah. Um, I notice uh, all the time when it comes to uh, myself becoming a Buddha, like that very idea. I sort of chop it right there, like that's where I sort of turn and go the, you know, back, like, that's not even possible. That's like lots and lots of training. And it reminds me of, you know, like, I'm going to graduate high school and become a firefighter. And, you know, it's just sort of like, like that. And I guess I realized maybe I could just sort of peek at that, you know, maybe I could begin to sort of like way down the line, uh, sort of set myself up to see that that could become possible with, you know, this path, this training, yeah and so yeah yeah good yeah and I'm glad it's starting to feel maybe 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 possible you know it's it's still get that like paralysis of overwhelm you know when you have mm -hmm. there's so much to do and so many things to do and so many approaches that you get kind of overwhelmed and stuck and can't do anything or you just do your tiny tiny thing and think that's all I can do because I'm just a little tiny person I'm not one of these big fancy people you know and yeah. it can kind of that can happen really easily yeah you know yeah. and then if you're remembering well your little tiny work is actually building momentum particularly if you intentionally want it to be building momentum Mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. otherwise our life just kind of races by doesn't it but if we start being a little bit more intentional about the the positive things that we're doing and kind of deepening the reasons and expanding the scope it does build this momentum where we feel like our life is gaining momentum towards something not just racing by and we're trying to catch moments of meaning you know we're consciously injecting meaning and bringing out meaning and noticing meaning and then that mm -hmm. builds its own habit yes yeah. yeah 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 other other thoughts coming up yeah your metaphor of the hotel and the tiny soaps and shampoos was so helpful right? Oh, right right because it is absurd and yeah we all do it and so it just helped me see oh my mind takes that thing and magnifies it makes it think it's something bigger than it is and then i want it totally totally I was saying, oh, I'm in Winnemucca. Woo! <laughs> like, who cares, right? Winnemucca. <laughs> Twin Falls, Idaho. Oh my gosh. <laughs> right. But, uh, you know, change is as good as a holiday. I think if we remember too that sometimes what we're enlivened by is novelty because we've kind of let the profundity of our everyday life 
miss us or we miss it. You know, we don't realize what, a, what a, an amazing life we have until we have it something to contrast. Yeah, so we're kind of chasing newness and then that newness gives us a refresh and it feels like happiness, but really it's just attachment hasn't been disillusioned yet. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So, yes, refuge, important. That's the summary. Did you have any like resistances or doubts that said, yes, but it is important or yes, but it is a refuge? Yeah, as you look at any of those. Yeah, Laran. Yes, uh, I, I, um, I, I wrote it down when you um, told us the real refuge is the Dharma you have uh, individually integrated, mm -hmm. and it makes me like so. It's so uh, full of possibility, mm -hmm. but it's full of um, like responsibility and um, fear of failing. Right? Mm -hmm. What like uh, what if I made a mistake because I'm all by myself integrating something that I catch here yeah. and there. And um, I, I don't feel like confident about that. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good point. And, um, you know, before I lose the, the thought, you know, I, I recommend you read the essay by Pema Chudrin called Fail, Fail, Fail Again, Fail Better, something like that. It, it's a, I think it was a talk, like a commencement speech she gave to a university or something. And Ooh, it's, okay. it's almost like plan to fail. <laughs> Assume That's you'll fail, game. fail again. Ooh, fail so better. unsuccessful. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, and Pema Chudrin always frames things so beautifully. She's um, got such an accessible way of talking. But, but to really think that it is... It's a paradox in a way. And you'll hear Lama Zopa Rinpoche say at the end of a dedication prayer, often he'll say, by myself alone, by myself alone, I will achieve enlightenment by myself alone. And sometimes you're like, alone? Yeah. <laughs> you know, really? Okay. But really what he's talking about is a very interesting part of the joyous effort section of the Lam Rim. In the joyous effort section of the Lam Rim, which is really about maintaining enthusiasm for the spiritual path and uh, having delight in virtue, one of the ways to keep that momentum is to have the mentality of come what may, whether mm -hmm. I'm supported or not, I'm gonna do this by myself with the background understanding that you're not right, that you will have support and that people will be helping you and there's people many steps ahead of you and there's people many steps behind you and we're all collaborating together for the great enlightenment where all sentient beings are free from suffering. You're not alone. But if you have the mentality of whether I feel and see tangible support or not, I'm going ahead because it's worthwhile. Mm -hmm. You actually have more power. Yeah, you have a lot more momentum. It's and, and I think it encourages support because you don't have a needy energy, right? You don't have a, you know, I, I need to, I can do this, but only if you support me. If you say, I'm going to do this with support or not, people mm -hmm. are often like, that's a great vision. I'll help you. But if you're like, everyone get on board with my vision. I can only do it if you help me. They're kind of like, eh, meh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yes. So it's, it's, it's really, it's just a mental shift. And I really recommend you read the joyous effort section of the Lam Rim Chen Mo by Lama Tsongkhapa. It's fascinating because it's basically burnout prevention and burnout recovery. <laughs> it's brilliant. It really is. And Lama Tsongkhapa, you know, 14th century, he's talking about things that are as relevant today. It's, it's mm -hmm. really interesting to think. So when you think myself alone, it's an inner resilience that says, I am nourished by this path, yeah, just in and of itself. Whether enlightenment happens in this life or in thousands of lifetimes from now, the process itself is nourishing if I let myself feel that, yeah? And the process is so enriching and the failures are fascinating, but we have to not identify with the failures. It's like you're using them as fuel for your practice. You're using them as fuel for empathy and compassion, but your mistakes aren't like an intrinsic fault. 
it's just a lack of learning or a lack of mindfulness because you haven't trained in the learning and the mindfulness enough for it to take hold. It's not like a fundamental deficiency. Just like your qualities are not fundamental amazingness that you just like came into this world magically having, they were learned and developed. And, you know, if you're someone who likes psychology, you can look at the difference between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset, right? Mm -hmm. And a growth mindset says, when I make a mistake, that means I have to try again and try in a different way because my assumption is I can do this with enough information and enough practice, I can do this. Mm -hmm. So a mistake just means try again. Yeah. A fixed mindset says, if I can't do this, I'll never be able to do this. And I have a fundamental flaw that will prevent me from it always. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if we're someone where things have come to us easily, like maybe we're, you know, conventionally intelligent, right? We're a smart person and things came easy to us in school when things don't come easy to us, we're not sure what to do with that information because we've never had to strategize about failure before. And so you think if it doesn't come naturally, I must not be able to do it ever. And you Mm -hmm. haven't trained in that skill set. Yeah. And so, you know, lots of Dharma students are smart cookies, you know, conventionally smart cookies. And, and that sometimes means that when the spiritual path doesn't come easily, that there is that kind of inner, I'm either flawed or the path is flawed. This doesn't work because I can't do it easily and I'm smart and I can do lots of things easily, you know, that can happen. And so we just need to remember that the spiritual path is not an intellectual exercise. It needs intellect to engage with it, but really it's about mental momentum. And I've met people with amazing IQs that don't get these things and people that are very simple in their intelligence that get complex concepts very quickly. So it's not always about intelligence. No, it's about uh, like, like when, uh, when you said that it's, uh, you have to integrate Dharma, it's, you, you can do it, but with, of course, there's uh, effort, um, joy, uh, joyous effort, effort uh, uh, with joy, like you're happy to do it. But sometimes when you want to put it in your daily, day-to-day life, you get, uh, that's when you can uh, do mistake, some mistakes and go to the other, other side. Like, I don't know if... Uh, you know what I mean uh, or not? Because uh, when it's in the book and you learn it, you come back to it, you say, okay, it's like this, but into the day-to-day life when your emotion comes and mixed up with something and your uh, compassionate mind, you ha- you need to put it in your life and you say, wait a minute, if I, I do it for myself or for others and it gets complicated, that's that's where I I say it's like kind of I, I'm afraid of that because it's easily mixed up in yeah day to day life. Well, okay. So then, if you make it really simple, like just really simple, if you share a house with people, and you know whether they're your family or they're your friends or your community or whatever or you're camping, who knows? You're sharing space with people, and you leave, and then you come back in a bad mood (laughs) Mm -hmm. does it have an effect on the rest of them of course yeah if you leave and you come back in a really good mood does it have an effect on all of them of course it does yes of course yeah whether they articulate it or not whether they say it or not they feel the benefit of your state of mind or the damage of your state of mind Mm -hmm. how much they receive that is based on them but they will feel an impact. You are a condition for people, right? Mm -hmm. We are all strong conditions for each other. We are not the cause of someone's happiness. We are not the cause of someone's suffering, but we are conditions for their happiness and suffering. So we want to be the best condition. The way to be the best condition is to come into control of your own mind. Yeah, and so you're working on yourself, working on yourself, this one individual, this self, this mental continuum, with the background understanding that every amount of effort you put onto yourself has an effect on others. 
right now, not just at enlightenment. You know, if you're in a good mood today, that's nice for the people around you today, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yes. Right? So, so kind of make it tangible and every day and then think, mm -hmm. you know, it's just increasing your radius of positive impact, the degree to which you can deepen and integrate the Dharma for yourself. And then, of course, the, the benefit of that is then you're happier too, right? So that's nice for you. But think about the benefit it is to others when you're at your best, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that help? Yeah. Yes, very much. Yes, yeah. thank you. We're aware of more than we articulate, I think. You know, if you're on public transportation and someone totally silent with neutral body language sits next to you, you still often can tell if they're in a good space or a bad space, can't you? Even if they don't say or do anything, they're just sitting close proximity, you can kind of vibe them out, right? Right, we're, we're you know, and some of that's projection and some of that's assumption, but some of it's, we're tuning into something and instead of being so concerned about what others are putting out there, let's think about what we're putting out there. And I think taking responsibility for the mental energy internally is such a kindness to others. Yeah, so we're not like a big black cloud coming into a room, you know, or like a vortex just sucking out all the air out of the room when we come in, you know. When we're in a mood, we don't realize what an impact we have on people if we're staying polite, we think that's enough. And it's something and it's better than nothing, but there's an atmosphere we bring with us. And so kind of taking responsibility for that is good for them and good for you.